So welcome everyone back to the afternoon and final session of commemorations and reparations. My name is Anya Lewis Meeks and I'm a second year graduate student in the Duke English department and a member of the Remembering the Middle Passage team. Um, I'd like to thank Ms. Mullen and Dr. Darity for their illuminating and engaging talk this morning. Um, it's given us much to think about regarding this uh, the potential future of reparations in the United States. Um, we consider this talk alongside uh, Professor Johnson's lecture last night on the historical context of the Middle Passage and our projects work more broadly. Our final speaker for commemorations and reparations is Pierce Freeland, who works with both historical and contemporary contexts in order to examine and comment on race, Afrofuturism, Black fatherhood, among other uh, really important topics. Um, our team was first introduced to Freeland's work uh, with the North Star Church of the Arts, a historic Durham church and community arts center located to the road from uh, Duke's East Campus. His multimodal work as artist, political activist, and educator will provide us with important context as to the lasting impact of slavery in North Carolina, and we are so grateful that he can be with us today. Um, but first, just a brief, a brief biography. Um, Pierce Freeland is a musician and Durham City Council member. He is the founder of Black Space, a digital maker space. He is the writer, composer, and co-director of the PBS animated series, The History of White People in America, which uh, has received numerous awards, including at the 2018 and 2019 Tribeca Film Festival, the 2018 Santa, Film, Santa Fe Film Festival, among others. Um, and he is the co-founder of the Emmy-winning series, Beat Making Lab. His critically acclaimed children's music album, D.A.D., uh, which has a delightful track uh, called Daddy Daughter Day, which features his daughter. And there's a great music video that you can all watch. It's really fun. Um, has, and he's been featured on NPR and the Today Show. Um, Pierce received a BA in African-American studies at UNC Chapel Hill and an MA in Pan-African studies at Syracuse University. He has taught courses in the departments of music, political science, and African-American studies at UNC Chapel Hill and North Carolina Central. He, uh, Freeland ran for mayor of Durham in 2017 and was appointed to serve on the Durham City Council in 2020. Uh, Pierce lives in Durham with his wife of 12 years and their two children. Um, just before uh, Pierce gives us his excellent talk, um, I would like to remind everyone to please use the Q&A function um, you can start using it before uh, at any time during the talk um, to either ask questions to Pierce or to leave any um, related comments regarding his talk. Okay, so thank you so much for being with us here today, Pierce, and please take it away. Thank you very much for the uh, wonderful introduction. It is a real honor to be here today. Thanks. Uh, so uh, I just wanted to, uh, yeah, reiterate a little. Um, uh, about the privilege uh, that I feel sitting here um, presenting at this conference uh, alongside so many uh, scholars and intellectuals and folks that I admire, uh, in addition to just being uh, kind of in awe of the towering intellect of Sandy Darity and Kirsten Mullen. They're also good family friends. And uh, it's nice to, to be sharing a platform with them today. Uh, I wear a lot of hats, as, as you heard about in the bio. Uh, most prominently these days, I would say, with city council. Um, and I haven't, I haven't given a good lecture in a while. Um, I've, I've had to step away from, from the classroom to get involved in politics. And um, I was supposed to teach a class last semester and just wasn't able to because of the intersection of COVID and, um, and uh, politics kind of taking over my schedule. So I'm really excited to get back into uh, academia for a minute uh, to tap that side of my brain. Um, and so I, I wanted to start off with a land acknowledgement. I'm gonna be talking about Durham and Haiti, uh, but just wanted to just wanted to shout out and acknowledge that, that here in Durham, we're on the, the historic land of the Okanichi Saponi people, which their traditional land. And I'll be talking about Haiti, which is the land of the, uh, the Taino Arwak folks. Um, just wanted to, to mention that before we jump in, as we talk about Pan-African legacies, uh, especially here in the Western Hemisphere, uh, to make that acknowledgement is really important 
as we uplift and celebrate and tell the stories of our ancestors to acknowledge the indigenous folks as well. So I've got a little Prezi I'm gonna pull up. Um, okay, everything was going well during the setup. And now I'm like, what happened to my keynote? Okay, here it is. All right, sharing my keynote presentation, great. All right, so I hope everyone can see. Um, <clears throat> so uh, commemorations and reparations, slavery's global legacies and local context. I was really, uh, when I was asked to come speak here, um, I, I've really been interested in the relationship between Haiti and the Haiti ever since I, I found out that, that the Haiti community, which I've heard that name, I've been to the Haiti Heritage Center for Kwanzaa Fest. I remember hearing about uh, from elders here in the Durham community about Black Wall Street and uh, Paris Street and the Haiti. This was the historic Black community, residential community here in Durham that was a partner to Black Wall Street. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, and it got its name from Haiti. Uh, it's just Haiti, it's really Haiti with the Southern drawl. So when I thought about, uh, you know, commemorating the global legacies um, of enslavement and, and thinking about the, the relationship between uh, Durhamites and Haitian folks from a pan -Afri from a pan African perspective, uh, particularly with that local context here, uh, giving this presentation through Duke, uh, I just am really excited to to jump into this legacy and to also to name some of the elders who who put me on to this history. People like Omishade Bernie Scott, folks like Dr. Baba Chuck Davis used to talk about this. Ayesha Shabu has done a, a dance piece around this with the American Dance Festival. So the, these are the folks who, who put me on uh, to this really important uh, legacy. And, uh, and we're gonna tie that into to how we celebrate Pan-African culture in Durham and also uh, I'm gonna tie in reparations a little bit as well. Um, oh, the last shout out, I, I got a shout out. Um, really amazing book uh, by Patrick Belgrade Smith, uh, The Breached Citadel was a source of some of the uh, information, particularly on Haitian history that we're gonna jump into today. So before, uh, before I get into the presentation, I wanted to, um, talk a little more about Black Space, which is, will be an important part of our story. Black Space is a digital maker space here in Durham uh, that I founded in 2016. We, we have a location in Chapel Hill as well that's been around since 2014, but it's a digital maker space for Black youth to come and learn about uh, digital storytelling, filmmaking, coding. We have 3D printing, we've done cryptocurrency. It's just a, it's a program for Black teens and, uh, and and we actually did a Haiti to Haiti program at Black Space that I'm gonna share and talk more about in more detail about today. But I thought to kick things off, it would be cool to introduce you to some of the kids uh, that I mentor and to introduce you to the space that is Black Space and some of the work that we do. So here's a little video about Black Space. Welcome to Black Space. We are an Afrofuturism digital makerspace based right here in downtown Durham, North Carolina. We do beats, we do emceeing, we do poetry, we do 3D printing, we do digital storytelling, and we need your help. Afrofuturism is about merging technology, creativity, and entrepreneurship. Black Space is not your typical STEM program. We do culturally relevant STEAM curriculum centering art and centering people of color who are underrepresented in tech. Should be 
because Black Space is an organization that helps the youth get into their like inner music vibe, and it's like pretty dope. And you don't really see that too often around Durham. Black Space, and this is like the first place that I've actually felt like I found a family outside of my home. I went home and I couldn't wait to come back. I find it empowering and, and amazing. Uh, you should fund Durham and Black Space's Afro Future because we are bringing the youth to a whole new level with skill sets that have not been brought anywhere else within this area. <laughs> All right, so there's a little bit about Black Space. And um, again, starting with that, we're gonna come back to Black Space when we get back to Durham, but I wanna rewind a little bit. That's a, that's a DJ deck going backwards. <laughs> we're gonna rewind a little bit. We're gonna take y'all back to, uh, to Haiti first before we get to Durham. And uh, I wanna talk about what, it, what was going on in Haiti the culture of resistance. Uh, I mentioned the Taino and Arwap inhabitants of uh, what at the time before it was called Haiti in 1804 when um, the Haitian Revolution took place and, and Black folks, African, formerly enslaved African folks overthrew their masters and renamed the country Haiti, uh, which was the indigenous name for this land. Um, it was called uh, Santo Domingo, and there was uh, resistance there to European invasion of this land that started with the Taino and uh, Arawak people. You know, they fought valiantly against uh, the colonists, but, you know, eventually fell victim to advanced weaponry and disease. Um, so we have, um, you know, prior to the Haitian Revolution between 1697 and about 1791, a population of enslaved Africans that grew from a hundredfold, from 5,000 folks to 500,000 uh, people. And, and really it was, it was the human capital that was Haiti's most abundant resource historically. They made sugar, and coffee and cotton, and the, the labor of these unpaid Africans created, you know, a surplus of goods, which made France very wealthy. Um, so we have this uh, uh, because of the the kind of accelerated pace, and I mean, uh, to grow a hundredfold in a hundred years from five thousand to five hundred thousand is pretty wild. It, it it speaks to the conditions, the slave labor. Uh, that was imported from Africa to Haiti, uh, you know, folks were, were forced to endure some pretty uh, horrible circumstances on these cane fields and processing kilns um, and this grueling kind of sweltering climate. Um, Belgrade Smith estimates the life expectancy here to be only seven years from the moment of capture, uh, you know, to, to death. Um, a seven year lifespan and there was a constant influx of African labor kind of coming in to meet this sweet tooth of Europe. It's very brutal, bloody uh, sweet tooth. So, um, but because of the constant influx of African labor and that African culture was largely preserved in Haitian society at the time of independence. So by the time, you know, you, you get that to that 500,000 at about 1791, you know, a decade, a decade and a half later in 1804, you know, we have the Haitian revolution and, and a lot of that Afro-Haitian culture is preserved. And uh, we'll get, I'll talk about this a little bit, um, but particularly like the language, the national language, Creole, it's not French, it's, it's, it's the indigenous Creole language and the national uh, religion of, vo of voodoo or vodun, um, you know, it's pretty, pretty rare to have that in a in a former colony. But it was really important for the 
African folks to really celebrate and center their traditions when they took power. And, uh, and it's still important, and there's still really important resistance happening in Haiti now to preserve those, uh, those legacies. And we'll see that in the Haiti to Haiti, because when we get to, we get to Durham, that still remains the case. The preservation of the Vodou, Vodun religion, the Creole language is a part of the, the, the Durham tradition uh, as well. So um, 1804, let's jump right in. My man, Toussaint L'Overture, uh, led a band of freed and enslaved Africans, oop, put my phone on silent, uh, freed and enslaved Africans, you know, machete in hand uh, to victory against the French colonists. Uh, the Haitian Revolution um, was the first successful Black insurrection tumbling the most profitable slave colony in the world. And for some context, you know, at the time, it was, a, it was a revolutionary period. We had the American Revolution in 1783, the French Revolution in 1779, oh, sorry, 1799. And then five years later, we had the Haitian Revolution. Um, as a result of this rebellion, I love this photo, just toss him, folk. <laughs> um, as a result, Haiti became, oh, sorry. Um, yeah, the first, oh, sorry. Yeah, Haiti became the first black republic and the only nation in the Western hemisphere to, to defeat three European superpowers, beat back the British, the Spaniards, and, and of course the French uh, led by Napoleon Bonaparte, who was seen as one of the world's uh, most powerful military leaders. Um, and it remained, that, that was a big victory um, in, the, in the psyche of people in the Pan-African world. The, the news of this revolution just reverberated throughout the Caribbean, throughout the uh, Western Hemisphere, um, and it, it was this, it was uh, just this really, really important um, moment in Black history, uh, and and in, in Pan African history. So the the Haitian Revolution remained a story um, that uh, Europeans tried to quiet. They didn't want people to hear about this revolt against institutions of imperialism, colonialism, and white supremacy because it was a threat to chattel slavery across the globe. Um, and, and indeed, it, it inspired other rebellions. Um, so, you know, Haiti was a nightmare, for example, to the US government, who at this time you know, was still had an enslaved Africans by the, by the millions and who proclaimed that, look what happened to Haiti. You know, they're gonna kill all the white people. This is gonna be a bloodbath. So it became, you know, propaganda for them to, to continue to perpetuate the systems of slavery in the US. And it was tough too, because after this, uh, after this revolution, um, you had the Western world really economically turning their backs on the Haitians to, and, and the ensuing kind of trade relations after the revolution were very unfavorable to Haiti and stunted their economic development. And that legacy of economic isolation has continued to plague Haiti in various forms well into the 21st century. Uh, and that's really important um, because, uh, you know, isolation from the global economy plunged this young nation into poverty. And, and that pop, not only were they not trying to do business with Haiti, but the French came back and demanded reparations from Haiti. So in this conversation about reparations and what black folks, you know, in the US and abroad deserve, it's important to know that after the French got their butts whooped and Napoleon got sent back to Europe, they came back a couple decades later demanding 21 billion now it was in the millions at the time but you know adjusted for how much it would be now in today's currency it is 21 billion dollars is what they wanted for what they're calling the theft of property and uh you know the destruction of their resources <clears throat> so 
uh, and they wanted this in exchange for recognizing Haiti as a sovereign nation and reestablishing diplomatic ties and diplomatic and economic ties uh, with Haiti. And guess what? They got it. They got their reparations, and it was not paid off until 1947. Um, so you know, uh, and that's just France. The United States banned trade with Haiti out of fear that the revolution would spread. You know, they wanted to isolate Haiti and, uh, and preserve, you know, the, the security of, of their system of racist uh, slavery, of racism and slavery. So, you know, Haiti was denied protection, for example, under the Monroe Doctrine. You know, it had to wait until the uh, passage of the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863 to receive formal recognition by the United States. So just imagine that already struggling from war where a quarter of your population was killed and now you have to, uh, while you're rebuilding, pay reparations uh, to your former oppressor uh, for lost property. And then, um, and even then, even then after they paid their tab, uh, and that debt, uh, there was a, 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 a legacy of, of economic isolation that continued and unfavorable economic uh, relationships that, that grew even after that. So, uh, but, but yet and still, I mean, it's important to mention, it's important to mention that, especially when we talk about uh, the, the, the case for reparations for black folks uh, now, today, um, it's also important, I, I don't want to end on, on kind of the, the, the sad note about kind of Haiti left in tatters. Haiti was the inspiration of so many folks in the Pan-African diaspora, and we're going to talk about one of those communities. So here we go. These are some of the founders of Black Wall Street right here. So meanwhile, in the U.S. in 1787, you know, at its height, uh, at this time, there were over 900 enslaved Africans living on 30,000 acres of land at Stagville Plantation, working the tobacco fields. And after emancipation, <clears throat> folks made their way by foot towards Dag downtown Durham and what's currently the Bragtown area, right down the train tracks. They settled in what's now Bragtown in North Durham. They settled in East Durham on Fayetteville Street around Pettigrew they created Black Wall Street. And these are some of the founders of Durham's Black Wall Street. So by 1907 in Durham, there was this self-sufficient collective of black business owners emerging as a beacon of success out of this kind of dark shadow of uh, Jim Crow and racism, you know, post reconstruction, uh, after slavery had formally ended, but this new system of oppression was emerging to replace it. Here in the Bull City, we had a barber named John Merrick, uh, who became the founder of Mutual Life, uh, the world's first black owned insurance company. And James Shepard founded Mechanics and Farmers Bank, the first black owned bank. You know, they planted the seeds for this bustling uh, black metropolis in the South. And these men built economic powerhouse, unlike any in the nation, on um, Paris Street right here in Durham. They built North Carolina College for Negroes. They have pharmacies, theaters, and hotels um, in the Haytai neighborhood. Now, and Paris Street was bordered uh, by a residential community called Haytai. That's what it was called. Um, this amazing Black community home to hundreds of families, churches, and businesses. Now, they were inspired by, uh oh, and this is the NC Mutual building. Sorry, I'm skipping through this stuff fast. So these are the founders, uh, some of the founders of Black Wall Street. This is the uh, North Carolina Mutual building. And here um, <clears throat> we get into the name, Haiti, all right? Haiti is basically, <laughs> like I said, if you take uh, the word, the name Haiti, and you put a Southern drawl on it, and you got country folk <laughs> saying it, they are gonna say, hey, Ty. And that's exactly where we got our name from. Um, celebrating the parallel stories of triumph 
against all odds. And in the case of, uh, you know, Toussaint Louverture, and uh, though he didn't, you know, live to see the um, end of the Haitian Revolution, was one of the, you know, he's like the George Washington of Haiti, um, you know, one of the lead revolutionaries. You know, you have this institution of white supremacy, this powerhouse uh, economically, and you have Black folks bucking back against the system and ripping their freedom from the uh, from the hands of their oppressors. Meanwhile, here in Durham, uh, we're in the Jim Crow South. You know, it ain't sweet for Black people down here. In fact, a lot of Black folks around this time were migrating north to escape slavery, to uh, take jobs in cities like Chicago and Detroit. You know, and and for those uh, who remained, we had a we had a really tough situation in our hands. I'm talking about in the South in general, but Durham, you know, was was really special. It was acknowledged by uh, Booker T. Washington and W. E. B. Du Bois as uh, as the pinnacle of Black excellence. And so, you know, similar to Haiti, you had this really um, inspiring story of triumph against adversity and Black Wall Street, um, you know, made up the, the, or sorry, the Haiti, well, I guess, sorry, Black Wall Street and bordering Haiti, that's what I meant to say, made up a center of Black life in Durham and exemplified Black excellence, entrepreneurship, uh, and, and was an example for folks throughout the South. So when it came time to choose a name for this community, uh, we chose we chose to to shout out Haiti uh, by calling ourselves the Haiti. So uh, this is Durham's Haiti Heritage Center, a uh, beautiful church, formerly the uh, St. Joseph's Church, up on the corner of Fayetteville and Lakewood. I've been to many a uh, African American dance ensemble performance, many a. Uh, a uh, uh, Lois Deloach concert or Art of Cool show in this beautiful building, which uh, is one of the last kind of uh, relics of this really beautiful, bustling, historic neighborhoods um, and, and was right on the edge of Highway 147, which when we talk about reparations and I think about all the things we need that need repairing, that's one of them, not just in Durham, but the ways in which urban renewal uh, created, destroyed, you know, black, um, black communities through the construction of, of highways, uh, what, what uh, James Baldwin called Negro removal. You know, if you stand on this back on these stairs right here at the Haytai and you kind of look, what would that be? Um, kind of, you know, by these white doors, if you look out towards the street, you'll see Highway 147. This was right at the edge of that highway that uh, destroyed hundreds of black homes and businesses when it was being built. Um, but this is this is the Haytai Heritage Center. And uh, I've walked in this building a million times, <laughs> never really looked at the top of the building. Y'all see that? At the top there, it's blurry. I'll zoom in in a second, but typically what you would expect to be atop a church like this would be a steeple, you know? It's Christian folk. They put a steeple on their buildings to celebrate Christ, but that's not what's atop the Haytai. Take a closer look. Now, uh, when someone first pointed this out to me, I was like, what is that? Is that a weather vane? Is that, I, I don't know what's going on there. So um, and someone had to kind of pull me to the side and explain, no, that's a that's something called a veve. That's a veve. That's a Vodun symbol used throughout, you know, Africa and the African diaspora, certainly in, in uh, Haiti um, as a really important kind of cultural symbol. So on the right, you have the veve, and here on the left, you have the image, like a black and white kind of image 
um, of that uh, same kind of design. It's a three-dimensional rendering of the graphic on the right. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a really important um, kind of spiritual symbol that brings me back to uh, something I, I shared a little bit earlier about the importance in Haiti, when it became Haiti, when it ceased to be Saint Domingue and became Haiti, um, you know, at the, at the end of the uh, revolution, again, that preservation of the Vodun religion, that preservation of the Creole language was really important. So too was it important when we erected atop the Haiti Heritage Center, this uh, Vodun symbol um, that we celebrate and honor that African religious uh, symbol. Um, okay, so let's see. Yeah, so we have our uh, Haiti to Haiti, Black people making uh, magic, making lemonade out of, out of their lemons from the sour fruits of slavery and Jim Crow, preserving our history. Uh, we did that here in Durham. Um, so I wanna, um, now I'm coming to Black Space. So the video I showed you at the beginning of this presentation was from Black Space. A couple of years ago, I think it was 2016, when we launched the uh, Durham location of Black Space, we did a big uh, cultural celebration and festival. Baba Chuck Davis, who's the founder of the African American Dance Ensemble, came into the space, did a blessing. Uh, we talked to the teens about this history. In fact, this presentation is something I, I had put together back then to explain to the young folks the connection between the Haiti and the Haiti. And uh, we involved uh, our folks, our youth in a creative collaboration. And then we took a field trip <laughs> to a place called Matinwa in Haiti. Um, there's an island in the center of Haiti called Laguanav, and Matinwa is a small city atop the island. Um, or sorry, small, it's more of a village, it's not a city. But in this village, they have a school where uh, they teach the national language. They have school curriculums in Creole. It's one of the only schools in Haiti that teaches in Creole. And uh, we did, our, we did a, a cultural exchange youth collaboration with this school between Black Space and the, and the Matinwa School, as it's called, uh, in 2016. And I want to show you a little bit about that project. Music, c'était passion. Déjà, en deux, non, trois jours, nous passions ensemble. Yo, me sentis me garder jeune en pile bagay. We Asian, black and white, making love. And the town na gabi on a kaila, muka bwesala. Si bitsa su gasoli, mi sa sunso fire. Music really is it's like a spiritual language. It's kind of the oneness that will bring different communities together. Yes. Beatmaking Lab is a community program that teaches kids electronic music production, you know, hip hop, EDM. We have a backpack full of equipment. We build ourselves into that community and we make music. You know, they think it's their first time beat making, but they've been making beats for as long as they could bang their hand on a table with a pencil and their fist. I like that. All we teach us how to translate that internal rhythm from the hardwood to the digital platform. We asked Alan to bring in his horn so we could do some uh, sample. all of the beats that you've made over the past two days. And the plan is to uh, work with Mikael Brun to build one of those beats into a song. 
and that that has not only a lot of power, but also has like really good swing and natural intuition. It makes me feel so proud to see the students contributing really great material into this track and learning the process of what it takes to make a, a song. The kids that are here, they don't have much and they're not playing with this opportunity. And that to me is what is so awesome about this experience. Because I really think what we're doing is making amazing music. song um, that we're working on is, is ready for some juice. Michael and Pierce, and along with all the other people in the studio, had gotten the song up to an amazing level. And I just added like a little bit of creativity to it. I added layers of tambour. I added layers of a bottle with water in it that turned into like a talking drum. And then uh, we all added a, a hook. Dance con ça. Dance con ça. Dance con ça. Now we have a song. And we're going to shoot a music video with Salim Reshamwala. What we're going to do is we're going to get a rough cut of the video today. And we are going to export stills from that rough cut and draw on top of that. We'll take that animation and pull it back in the final cut and hopefully it'll be like a cool, fun little vibe. I mean, we're building something here and you can't do that without the tools. So we leave the technology in the hands of the community so they can continue to make music and express themselves. Unmute. Sorry, I was muted. Um, so that was just a brief synopsis of our program in Haiti. I'm going to take off screen share for a minute. Um, stop share. There we go. Okay, cool. Um, so yes, uh, in the video there, you saw a lot of Durham residents. Um, we really, Durham really showed up in Haiti for that Haiti to Haiti. The brother with the long locks, was Alan Thompson, who was a North Carolina Central University alum and a black space facilitator. Uh, Yoni was a former student of ours, with the young lady singing Danse Consa. She's a, a Durham resident who came through one of our after school programs um, at the Durham Performance and Learning Center years ago. And Salim Reshamwala is another Durham filmmaker. So we really made a, a great uh, international connection. And then on the other side, here in Durham, uh, we did animation for the final music video, and we uh, threw a concert. We threw a, there was a hurricane the following year, and we brought Michael Brun, who was the DJ producer, uh, who's a native of Haiti, um, went to Davidson for college, actually. Uh, he came um, down to Durham, and we did a benefit concert and raised some money for, um, for the community in Matinois. Uh, at the restaurant um, Palace International, the African restaurant in Durham. So that's just a little bit about the collaboration, um, the Haiti to Haiti collaboration. So, uh, and, and the other partner there was Beat Making Lab, which was a, a program I, I created with uh, Apple Juice Kid, who you saw there in the video. So yeah, it was, it was a beautiful opportunity for a contingent of Durham-based musicians, beat makers, filmmakers, poets to travel. We donated equipment and, and we brought some of the uh, genius of the Haitian community back to the Haiti as well. So that was really fun. Um, I, I'm noticing I missed, a, I missed kind of a step. Uh, it occurred to me as soon as I started the video that I said there's a veve on top of the, the Haiti Heritage Community Center, but I didn't say what a veve was. It's a, it's a religious symbol. I, I mentioned that part, I guess, but it kind of represents 
um, like almost like a astral portal. It's like a cosmogram. They would take uh, the 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 um, you know some kind of chalk or uh, um, you know some material that they would lay on the ground to put the two dimensional image of a veve on the ground, and it would help facilitate ritual different spiritual and ritual practices. Um, so another thing about black space that I haven't talked too deeply about yet, but I'll mention now is Afrofuturism. <laughs> Afrofuturism is kind of the idea of black people imagining, shaping, manifesting, creating the future. And uh, I think Toussaint Louverture, Harriet Tubman, I would certainly consider them Afrofuturists, folks who, uh, who are creating and shaping their future. And I think in preserving at the point of Haitian independence, the uh, Vodun religious and language traditions, and also bringing that to Durham when we erected the Veve atop the uh, Haiti Heritage Center, uh, particularly with an image that's about kind of manifesting and transforming reality, I thought was really special and really, and really cool. And I look at that building completely differently now knowing what's on top of it. Um, so I, I say that to say that, that the Haiti community was not simply emulating Haiti in, as, a, as, a, um, as a cultural artifact. It was also in, in the practice, in the way that we um, are continuing the legacy through black space. You know, I, sometimes I feel like the, the work we do is, you know, painting a veve on the ground and manifesting uh, music or art paintings, apps, animations, you know, we're, we're taking black culture and transforming it. Baba Chuck did that, uh, Polly Murray did that, Ernie Barnes did that. These are different black artists. So I think centering culture and using it to transform reality is something that Durham very much has in common with Haiti and is an important part of what I'm talking about when I say a legacy of revolutionary Pan-African culture in Durham in the context of, uh, of what we've inherited uh, from Haiti through the Haiti. Um, so kind of in closing, I just wanted to, uh, yeah, I just want to under, underscore that particular point. Um, you know, Baba Chuck Davis, Kwanzaa Fest, the Bimbe Festival, Black Space, um, and the events that Black Space does, the Cypher, Beat Making Lab, even things like History of White People in America are shaping culture and understanding through a Pan-African and Afrofuturist lens. Um, and that feels very much rooted uh, in this kind of legacy of, of uh, preserving culture as a tool for change. So um, let me take another peek to make sure. I, oh, I was gonna close the video. So. Um, there's one more quick video I wanted to show you, which was the just the final music video from the Haiti to Haiti collaboration. Uh, the beat was produced by the kids in Haiti. The animation was done by the kids in Durham. And uh, I, I'm, I have a verse on the song where I talk about the Haitian Revolution uh, alongside some MCs from Matinwa. So I thought that would be a good piece to close with. And then um, I think that'll bring us to 2.15, which would be about 45 minutes. And then we'll have 30 minutes for Q&A after. So um, with no further ado, I'm going to pull my screen back up right quick. All right. OK, now I have to go through the whole slideshow. Sorry. This would be a good review. Veve, boom. All right, so here's our, the final project of the Haiti to Haiti collaboration. It's called Danse Con Sa. Bible <laughs> 
Black and white, keep making love. And the town, like a beer, like a kaila. Buka boy sala. Si bitsa su gasolin, mi sason su fire. Revolutionary, uh, notorious, get it juicy, baby. Uh, Toussaint with my troops up, you bougie like Grey Poupon, you get your crew cut. Uh, took freedom from Napoleon. Uh, now we're standing at the podium saying, Hey, Haiti, uh, it's your birthday. Uh, the beat drops in the worst way. Think it's so sad, who puts his body? The Ziva can't get the eye, I'm not sexy, but they must have seen Coco if he was so capacity. But she puts on a Zilea, who kept us it. Fuckers every day, yo, sack, boss, eh? No pop campaign, nigga, I'm not bullet. Say, fuckers, lee, let's see, Captain B, Coco, and Capcool, let's see, they've had the traversing, yo. All right, so that's that. Oh, how do I get out of here? Stop share. Okay. Cool. So yeah, um, I, I guess uh, one more really quick. I know I said I was done, and I am done. I'm <laughs> totally done. I'm ready to answer questions. But uh, just real quick, I just want to say, you know, when I think about, you know, this conference, commemorations and reparations. So the commemoration part of that, uh, to me, really speaks to remembering Haiti and the Haitian Revolution as a really powerful moment in Black history and one we should all draw inspiration from, not just, uh, you know, in, in title of the Haiti, but to actually remember that enslaved Africans rose up and, uh, and, and told Napoleon and, and, and two other superpowers from Europe to kick rocks. And uh, that's powerful. It was powerful at the time. It just sent shockwaves throughout the Pan-African world. So we need to remember that. We need to celebrate that uh, and uplift that. On the reparation side, uh, I think a reclaiming not just of, of the money that we are deserved, and there are trillions, as I'm sure you heard from the Darities, or sorry, Dr. Darity and Ms. Mullen, there's, we're owed quite a bit, um, but among our inheritance that has been denied Black people is the, the rich cultural inheritance that they strove to preserve uh, in Haiti and, you know, with, and culturally also through the Haiti as well. So those, both of those legacies, um, I think are important and I hope I made it local for y'all. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Honestly, just stunning kind of introduction to some of the arts, uh, community arts activism in Durham, but also that really kind of nice and clear history of the Haiti community. Um, and its connections with Haiti, certainly, but also the many different ways that um, these legacies of enslavement have disenfranchised um, Black Durhamites, Black North Carolinians. Um, and I'm, I'm really, really just very impressed with the way that Black Space um, and the Beat Making Lab have, have, I don't know, done some of that work of exposing some of this Black cultural legacy, um, even in the face of 
America more broadly. Um, so thank you again so much for sharing and for your talk. Thank you. um, we've got a few questions in the Q&A um, kind of tab. Again, please feel free to leave questions um, as they come to you. Maybe as the conversation continues, if any come up, um, please feel free to ask for clarification. But I'm really interested maybe to just kick us off um, in kind of one of your last comments about Afrofuturism and how you see Afrofuturism playing a, a key role in your work. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that I was really impressed by the kind of connection between Afrofuturism and Black futures, right? Uh, especially thinking about your role as like an educator um, in STEAM um, coding, like all those kind of um, programming, programming work that Black Space does. And I'm really curious as to whether you see as part of this uh, educating practice, part of your creative practice, any of the more kind of speculative um, or spiritual kind of uh, connotations of Afrofuturism um, entering that space. And um, yeah, if you could talk any uh, more about that at all. Yeah, um, thank you uh, for the words of affirmation. And yeah, I mean, the, the, there's a big, a, a lot of people think about Afrofuturism and think about like, you know, science fiction, like, like, Wakanda, you know, forever. And what's interesting, I think Black Panther really, I remember we were doing work in Afrofuturism for a long time and then Black Panther came out and then it was like on a larger platform because more folks were talking about the the speculative fiction. But there is a, a Black queer uh, uh, thinker and scholar and movement worker named Adrienne Marie Brown she and, and Walida Imarisha uh, are both part of a collective called Octavia's Brood. And it, they're a clique of movement workers who are also like blurdy science fiction heads. And, and you know, Octavia Butler is the, is the cosmic matriarch of their collective uh, who was a wonderful science fiction writer. And, you know, they say, this is their quote, all organizing work is science fiction. All organizing work is science fiction. And, you know, when you think about that in a historical context, of course it is. Like Harriet Tubman's work, it was science fiction. It's, yo, we're free. <laughs> like that was not the lived reality of her peers at the time. And she had to organize and, and, and struggle and fight to make that a reality, you know, for for King or or Queen uh, Rosa, you know, to sit down, that's science fiction. She, well, they were looking at her like, "What planet are you from? <laughs> you think you can just sit down, like Greensboro, sit in? Like, yo, y'all really must be like tripping. Like, what 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 is this about? It's just even to say Black Lives Matter, like." We're speaking it into existence because we don't in a system of white supremacy. That phrase alone is is a manifestation. It's a it's a uh, what do you call that when it's a, not a mantra, but when you uh, yeah when you when you draw a veve on the ground and you chant something until it becomes reality. That's what that what I think of when I hear uh, Black Lives Matter, at least. And that idea, you know, speculative fiction, that all organizing is science fiction. We are trying to create a better world, the world that we deserve. And, um, and it's, never been, it's never been a wild ask. Like, <laughs> yeah, we don't wanna be chattel like a cow. That's it. You know what I'm saying? Like, we just wanna get a burger. Don't kill us, officer. Ask us a question first before you pull the gun out. Like, it's not crazy, but those things are science fiction. So much so that white people will, you know what I mean? Not all white people, but some of them, they will run up on your house and burn a cross in your lawn, hang you from a tree, and, and j just for, for making such an utterance, I'm a human being. 
that's how crazy white supremacy is. And what's wild about that too, and I think about this from in the context of speculative fiction as well, you know, and, and Freire talks about this in a Pedagogy of the Oppressed, that shows the extent to which black liberation, <laughs> as much as it is about us freeing ourselves, it's also about us freeing white folks from white supremacy. Like something's wrong with your head if like, I don't want these, you know, black people to come to my school has got you so hot that you want to throw a brick, a brick through someone's window and burn their house down and blow a church up with some children in it. Like that's, <laughs> that's, that's how you come in. Like, so that doesn't even, it doesn't even sound real. Our reality is so bizarre that, that our ancestors calling for the most basic human rights is considered radical. You know, and that's why Afrofuturism is important because we need to be the ones creating the future because we know what's going to happen if we leave it to, to folks who don't see us as human beings. So that's, yeah, I, I, all organizing is science fiction. When I first heard that, I said, ooh, ooh. <laughs> and, you know, to name Octavia Butler, whose book Parable of the Sower came true for the past four years, she predicted in the 90s, we would have a president that had the slogan, make America great again. That's a verbatim quote from her fictional book, Parable of the Sower, that she wrote in the 90s. She prophesized, uh, 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 you know, so it, it, we've been had prophets, too many. Yeah. And I really, I really think that that kind of last point nicely connects your work to this immediate political moment, right? Like, uh, if if uh, organizing is science fiction and a, and a future reality, like very clearly, members of this um, these United States are also living in a different reality, right? Mm -hmm. Like a reality mm -hmm. that keeps being warped and, and transformed as as. QAnon, um, other conspiracy theories and platforms like continue to um, to take residence and, and entrench themselves in this country. Um, mm -hmm. So I have a question here kind of asking you to explain or explore a little bit more about your kind of journey as a political activist, mm. um, your choices in 20 or your, your uh, choice in 2017 to run for mayor, your work on the Durham City Council now, and what you're hoping to achieve kind of from this political platform. That's great. Well, you know, uh, thank you for the question. Um, <laughs> what I was thinking of when you were talking about, you know, QAnon, like, yeah, there, there, there are folks there trying to shape reality, but we got our folks too. I've been reading Sandy Darity's work, you know, since I was in high school, college, and that's the universe that I would like to live in. <laughs> you know what I mean? So when I ran for mayor, uh, let's see, 2017, it was a couple months after uh, Donald Trump was elected president that I threw my hat in the ring. And so, you know, first quarter 2017, you know, there's a, a, a Durham magazine with Bill Bell, our, my beloved mayor. He's been the mayor since I was in high school. I was born here. He's mayor emeritus and i was like yo what a what a shift what a shift nationally from barack obama to donald j trump and what a shift locally after you know we haven't for the entirety of the 21st century we've had mayor bell as our mayor and, and now there's this vacuum of institutional knowledge and um, black political power that has vanished. And I looked around like, who's next? You ever seen that um, hip hop Harry meme on TikTok? Who's next? Yeah. Like, who's yeah. next? Yeah. You know what I mean? And I didn't see myself or my politics anywhere. I didn't see anybody advocating for the jobs guarantee that Sandy Darity was rocking with. I didn't see anybody talking about you know, universal base income or talking about police accountability, not in, well, sorry, not in political power. There was hip hop against racist war who I've been rocking with, you know, uh, since 2004. And 
There was the Southern Coalition for Social Justice. There's Black Workers for Justice. You know, there's, there's the Youth Organizing Institute. Like my people, all my organizers who were like millennials were talking about it, but nobody in who had political power locally was talking about it. And so I'm wondering how the hell we got into this mess federally. And I'm looking around locally like, oh, we don't have nobody here at the local level to advocate for the things that will need to be scaled. One of the things my dad, my dad passed away um, about a year and a half ago. And he used to, he was an architect. He used to talk about fractals, the fractal nature of the universe, which, you know, is basically the idea that the, <laughs> the design of something at its smallest unit is the same as its largest. A good example of fractals would be if you Google the video, the powers of 10, and you'll see that the smallest unit uh, of existence that we can perceive is like an atom, which is like a ball with some other balls swinging around it. That's the same as a galaxy. Like it's, they look similar at the small and the large. And so, you know, the analogy there would be if we can get, if we can get a jobs guarantee at the municipal level, then we have a proof of concept for a state or federal program. We need to start somewhere and we need to start locally. And so, and I didn't see anybody advocating those revolutionary type policies locally in Durham, though I knew a lot of people locally in Durham with those politics, you know, that are busy trying to knock the door down at city hall or the county commissioner, but we don't have nobody in the chair. So, you know, I, I I heard a calling to step up in to step into a world. That's a KRS one for you. Step into a world, you know, to create that, manifest that reality that we deserve. And you know, I didn't win, obviously, <laughs> in 2017, but we changed the conversation so radically and made such an impact that I really think shifted the narrative. And you know, three years later, my 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 opponent, Steve Shul, uh, was my biggest advocate when the seat opened up for appointment. So uh, yeah, just that was kind of where it started. I, I I'm my background is in cultural movement work. You know, through hip hop and through uh, you know organizing work. Um, I, I was the work for Voices for Working Families, you know, which was voter education, mobilization, and uh, GOTV organization in 2004. And, you know, working at, oftentimes me and uh, Aiden Darity, who is Kirsten and Sandy's eldest son, we were in a hip hop group called Language Arts. You will be hard pressed to find a organizing group that through a concert that language arts did not perform at, like we were, you know, providing a soundtrack to what organizers and political activists were doing. And that was our community. That was our tribe. Those were the people who bought our albums and showed up at our shows and we would come and knock doors with them. And it was just an important part of the organizing apparatus is, is the cultural voice and has been, it has been since Forever, forever, ever, forever, ever. And I, the, the biggest example, you know, that I think about is like Ida B. Wells. Ida B. Wells was organizing to stop lynching, at, at the epidemic of lynching, lynching that was happening through the South through her journalism and storytelling and truth telling and revealing what was going down. But then it was also important for Billie Holiday to take a poem from Lewis Allen you know, or Mirabel, Abel Mirapal, and, and to make Strange Fruit become the soundtrack of that movement, you know, alongside, you know, Emmett Till and Jet Magazine. And, you know, it was a critical mass of folks doing the work, but the cultural part of the movement is vital. It's the lifeblood. It is the soundtrack. It is the pulse of the movement. And prior to throwing my hat in for, uh, for office, that was where my contribution was based. And I saw an opportunity to serve in a different capacity by, through, by 
you know, running for office. And uh, yeah, I think that answers part one of your question. Um, but I'm so long winded. I'm sorry. I just. No, you're doing. I mean, that was a really, I think, kind of a lovely uh, way of th- talking about giving back to an organizing commu- uh, community as well. Um, and I think it also raises interesting points about just what it takes to get um, to get from kind of grassroots activism to political change and policy change. And it is these kind of steps, right? Like it's it's not so simple as everyone has an audience with the president. Um, and I, I really commend um, that choice to kind of start taking those steps. Um, we really have, or we have a really, I think, interesting uh, comment slash question um, that relates back to your um, kind of t- talk about the importance of culture. Um, and it's from the founding member of, or one of the founding members of the Chuck Davis African American Dance mm. Ensemble, um, who would like to let you know that they are so appreciative of the presentation, research, and investment in our community. Um, brings up that uh, Erzerli Dantor sits atop Hay. Uh, hey Tai, and she is a fierce protector of women, children, those neglected in society. Is um, phenomenal women directors of Haiti take the lead in highlighting global and local strengths? Um, and the comment is asking um, to see histories of Black women integral to the establishment of Black Wall Street and Black excellent mm. uh, more broadly elevated alongside Black Wall Street leaders. Mm. Um, so, if I had to turn that into a question, I think it would be to uh, if you could comment more kind of on the role of women in this um, Durham cultural uh, movement? Yes, uh, I appreciate the question and just want to, uh, you know, acknowledge the intersection of racism and patriarchy that uh, this question speaks to. And I was uh, raised and, and mentored by radical Black feminists who, who drilled that into my psyche at a very, very young age. And I appreciate the, I appreciate the, the, the question. The, you know, the photo even that I presented of the men, it's like, you know, eight men uh, who are, who are uh, deemed the, you know, fathers of Black Wall Street. Um, you know, there's an erasure there about the other contributors to the robust and uh, multifaceted Black abundance that existed here. And um, a lot of times, you know, it's the, it's the writers of the history who choose who to highlight and, and uh, you know, the, that intersection of not just, not just patriarchy and white supremacy, but heteronormativity, and you know, there's some there's some class privilege there around, you know, bougie folks and Christian folks, and you know, there's a lot going on there that that um, that erases voices that don't fit into, uh, you know, that higher that hierarchy which is rooted in white supremacy and proximity to it, you know, because the bougieness is is also connected to colorism and. You know, there was there were some there were some prominent black churches that would that would receive the likes of the W. B. Du Boises and were getting all the praise that wouldn't let folks of a certain skin tone in because they had a brown paper bag rule up in there. So, you know that that all of those elements are uh, really important. But you know, when I think about the the legacy of uh, Durham's black excellence. Um, and I think I, I think I or did. I don't know if I mentioned Polly Murray's name or not, but I'll mention it. Did I yeah. mention? Just briefly. Just briefly. Oh, too brief. <laughs> Clearly, too brief. I think about Polly Murray, you know, and just talk about erasure. You know, you Google Brown versus Board of Education, you see Thurgood Marshall. He's the first Black justice. That's, you know, that's, that's my man. That's Thurgood. People don't realize that Thurgood Brown versus Board of Education was built on research by Durham's own Hillside High School graduate, Polly Murray, and the work that that she put in as a scholar, as a lawyer, not to mention as an Episcopal priest, as a as a poet. You know, there's your cultural movement worker right there. I'm writing scholarly papers that are shaping federal policy 
and I got some crazy stances for y'all about Jane Crow. What's that? That's the intersection of patriarchy and racism. Before Kimberly Williams Crenshaw gave us the gift of the term uh, intersectionality, uh, Polly Murray had a very deep understanding through her lived experience about what that was all about and, and wove that into some heavy bars with her poetry. So uh, yeah, I mean, there, there's, um, you know, Ann Atwater, um, you know, just the, the list goes on of all of the wonderful uh, matriarchs and queer folks, you know, uh, Andre Leon Talley, you know, um, the, 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 the cosmic uh, um, uh, divine masculine and feminine energies embodied within Baba Chuck himself, you know, who, who was an inspiration and a mentor for me. So yeah, I appreciate the question and, and um, I'll dig deeper next time if I have to give this presentation to name that in the presentation and, and find ways. And we didn't even get into the, into the revolutionary women of the Haitian revolution. I think the only name I shouted out on that end was Toussaint Louverture, but there were plenty of machete wielding mamas like holding it down uh, in Haiti. I mean, it was different there because I mentioned the lifespan, you know, from capture to death was seven years and the population was overwhelmingly male in Haiti, but there were some key figures there that I could have highlighted as well. So thank you for the question. Um, there's a, a kind of comment um, that Viola Turner turned the NC Mutual on to mortgage investment, served mm -hmm. on the board of directors, and was the first African American woman on the uh, New York Stock Exchange. So, that, what's the name again? I've Viola not heard that Turner. name. Yeah, so that's really cool. Thank you. Thank you um, for. Yeah, and just to kind of acknowledge another question by that same um, uh, participant. Um, speaking about early prophets of Afrofuturism, can you speak to why an African Methodist Episcopal Church in particular would be the site for a veve as a symbol of global Black consciousness? Mm. That's a good question. Um, I, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, in fact, I wonder even if it's, it, I don't know who put it up there, how they climbed the top of the, you know, that, that's a mystery to me and the, and the elders in the community that I've asked uh, and that I have access to don't know, haven't known the answer to that question either. Cause I had the same question. It's like, you know, some Christian folks would look at that and say, that's the devil. If they knew, most people don't even look. I didn't, I just assumed you see something up there, you assume it's a crucifix, but you get a closer look, you're like, yo, that's that's sacred geometry up there. Like, what's going on? So I, I don't know the answer to that. It's a mystery to me. Um, and one that I'd love to to put anyone on this call to figure out and call me when you find out. Cause it's it's some subterfuge there. I mean, I think there's ways in which, especially Afro-Caribbean folks, Afro-Latinx folks, like they'll take Catholicism and they'll flip it. Don't get it twisted. All the Mary, all them different. Those are <laughs> Yoruba demigods with with Euro with European names. Why? Because if you call them Oshun or Obala or their name, their Yoruba names, you know you could get in trouble. So okay, so Saint John or Saint such and such, Saint Mary, like they took on the aura. And if you look at a, if you look at some of those Afro Caribbean shrines. They, they look a whole lot like, you know, West African Yoruba land shrines. So um, that there is an interesting conversation and push and pull there between the religious practices of the colonizer and of the African folks who are, are resisting the mental and physical, um, you know, imposition um, of language, of religion, of, you know, et cetera. So that, that is an interesting question. Yeah, and if we're thinking too about the legacies of, of enslavement, um, Vodun itself, right? Like came out not only from Yor Yoruba um, 
religious practices and African derived religious practices, but also was distinctly shaped by um, colonialism and, and slavery in, in Haiti. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we're just kind of about um, out of time. And I wanted to thank you so much for this, honestly, really enlightening and also just really fun, not fun as in difficult material, but I, I feel like energized and kind of rejuvenated by the conversations that we've had today. And also by all the work that uh, Black Space is doing, the Beat Making Lab are doing, um, and can't wait to hear more from you. Um, and and see what what happens in your tenure on the Durham City Council. I think that'll be a great a great journey to to bear witness to. Um, do you have Thank any you. kind of closing comments you'd like to make? Um, I would just say well, two things in closing. One, um, I hope you'll everyone on the line or who's watching will stay in contact. If you ever have questions, or more importantly, if you find out <laughs> about the Veve on top of Haiti, you learn some history that I could add to this presentation, please reach out. I'm totally accessible. You know, Instagram is my social media platform of choice, and it's just my name, at Pierce Freelon. But you could also hit me up on Twitter or Facebook. And also, uh, for Bl on Black Spaces part, um, Black Space has really been struggling because of COVID. We, we do... Black space is basically like after school programs for teens. And, um, you know, our space is really tiny and it's not really safe to, uh, to do programming there because of COVID-19. So we've been kind of closed for like the past year almost at this point. And, uh, you know, anything you could do for those who are interested in supporting, um, you know, just go over to our website or our Instagram and, you know, share, like, contribute, whatever. Um, to Black Space, and that would be appreciated. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, and just to kind of close out the conference, I um, wanted to thank everyone who was able to attend um, either today's events or yesterday's event. Um, and on behalf of the whole team, uh, we see this conference as just the introduction to broader conversations about the impacts and legacies of enslavement on um, of, of the impacts and legacies of enslavement of Africans and about our role as researchers in using digital methods um, and other methods to commemorate the deaths of the enslaved. Um, and so if you're interested in taking these conversations further, um, we will be in communication in the near future about opportunities to do so. Um, Pierce has already uh, let you know how to get in contact with him, but if you are interested in speaking to either us or if we can connect with some of the other um, conference uh, participants, then we would be happy to do so. Um, so again, thank you everyone. Um, have a great afternoon and uh, thank you for coming.